Richard Reed, and I'm live. I think I'm live. The uh, I've never done this before, so I'm assuming that everything worked like uh, the instructions say, but I really don't know. My um, uh, I was unable to get anyone to come into the house to help me set this up. So I did everything myself because of the virus. You know, that's that's um, breaking the rules to come in and, and help help someone like that, even if that person is your father. No, I'm just saying. Um, but I think it's working. Earlier today, I had a number of crashes my, on my computer. I'm, I'm dependent on the computer, which is sitting right here, but you can't see it. And the computer is grabbing the music and the video and then streaming it over the internet. And so it goes over the internet, it goes over a power line adapter, and it goes into a, into a a um, modem in the other room and it goes out on the wire and then in the, in the corner of my yard the wire comes out of, of the ground and elevates about two inches for about four inches and then go back in the ground and so there's a lot of places where this could could fail and actually my software crashed uh, two or three times today and so I was terrified and my biggest fear um, of this whole thing uh, is not, you know, my memory or the, how I'm going to play the piano, but whether this is uh, this is going to work. And um, and then it gave me a start today because my computer started crashing. So if I lose if I lose you, um, I apologize. And if this is not broadcasting, in other words, if you clicked on the link and you've seen a blank screen. Let me know right away, because then maybe I can fix it. The, um, the program today um, is a program that I'd wanted to play as a house concert this spring. And I was casting about for um, uh, venues. And obviously one venue would be my house. And I have a lovely Steinway D. Um, but it's in a very small room. And I can accommodate at most 15 people in this room, uh, if, you, if you count the player. So that make, would make an audience of 14. So, this is, so if this works, this is an excellent, uh, under, under the video, uh, you know, there's um, notes uh, that you can scroll down and look at, um, but it will consist of three Scarlatti Sonatas, um, an Albanus, uh, Albanus Triana, and the Chopin B minor sonata, and then I, I programmed an encore, which I'll talk about later. And if I'm talking too much, um, really, there's no way you can get in touch with me because I'm not watching comments. You know, I'm going to be busy playing, and, um, so I guess that's just tough. The uh, first composer, um, Scarlatti, is well known to pianists. Um, Scarlatti is famous for having written 555. Um, harpsichord sonatas, and uh, he's known principally for these, and and uh, pianists love them. They transfer beautifully to the piano, and uh, they're wonderfully written. Um, Scarlatti was a harpsichordist himself, and um, apparently, um, he was he, he was born in Italy, but actually, I always thought he was born in Italy, and then. You know, uh, got a really good job in the court, uh, in the Spanish court in Spain. But I researched him a little bit and found some very interesting details about his life. And he was born in, um, uh, not in, in, um, in a part of, of uh, the Italian peninsula that actually was under the. Um, was, was a uh, part of Spain, considered, you know, there was a protectorate of Spain. And so actually he was born a Spanish citizen. And he lived um, all over Europe, and uh, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, um, all over Italy, uh, over the Italian peninsula. And, um, but he's, he's known for the 555 sonatas, and he wrote those in the last 25 years of his life when he was uh, a court musician in Madrid. And, but he did stuff during the rest of his life 
And I was very surprised to learn that he also wrote operas. And I thought he was just these Scarlatti sonatas alone, but no, he wrote operas. And he actually um, uh, um, produced an opera or, or uh, directed an op one of his operas in England. He went to England. Uh, I found it, well, fun fact uh, that um, Scarlatti was born in 1685. And that was the same year that Handel and Bach were born, three titans um, of the Baroque era. Uh, when it rains, it pours. And um, he knew, uh, apparently he knew Handel and um, held Handel in very high regard. And um, they, there was a, um, when he was in residence in Rome, uh, apparently, Handel came to Rome, and they and they you know got together, and they decided to, that they would have a playoff of sorts. And you know this used to be popular, you know, in, in olden days, and you know, uh, and even Beethoven used to, you know, he would have uh, improvisation competitions and that sort of thing. And, uh, and these were two grown men, and so they had a harpsichord and an organ playoff, and um, apparently. You know, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> um, Scarlett and, and Handel was a, was uh, recognized as a as a, um, a fabulous keyboard player and a harpsichordist. And apparently, Scarlett won the harpsichord part of the competition, and Handel won the organ part of the competition, which I think is very clever. And you have a split decision like that because then everybody gets something. But uh, it also said that. He held Handel in such high regard that whenever he mentioned Handel, he would cross himself. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's so here's three sonatas, and um, which you can see listed in the program notes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I forgot to mention that I have two microphones, and I'm pointing at the webcam, which has a microphone in it. And I'm using it for my voice. And of course, you can't see the webcam because that's how you're looking at me. And I also have a, a microphone for the piano. And one of my jobs as the audio engineer of this event, since no one will come into my house, is to swap microphones. So let me swap over to the better microphone. I think the volume's a little lower over there, but um, I think overall uh, it's going to be a better experience. So let me do that.
one of the, um, uh, as I was, have been rehearsing this program, <laughs> one of the things you're always afraid of, and I had a few memory slips here and there, um, it, or memory slips, of course, and um, I discovered during my rehearsing that um, in these, these uh, Scarlatti sonatas, they're all uh, two parts, you know, an A and a B part, and each part is repeated. Well, I, I, I realized in my rehearsals that I wasn't keeping very good count. And sometimes I would get the, to the end of a part and then forget whether or not I'd taken the repeat. And then just always taking the repeat just to be safe. But then, you know, then you've done the repeat twice, which is not right. So um, I don't think I did that. I tend, I, I tend to do that in the C major uh, sonatas. The next work, um, skipping ahead, because he was Castilian, and um, I remember my college roommate told me that, that you're supposed to say Albanus with a lisp, and I thought he was pulling my leg until I actually talked to a native Spanish speaker, and I asked him, and he said, yes, yes, he is native, he's, he's positive, and I said, well, I shared the story to him, I said, don't tell the story, I'll tell you. Albanus, um, fun fact. Albanus was an extremely accomplished pianist, and he was um, he was a Liszt pupil. And there's a, a famous photograph of, of Liszt surrounded by his students, and one of them, uh, there he is, is Isaac Albanus. Not Albanus, but that's what we say. And um, he wrote in a fairly, um, uh, I would say, traditional style of the of the 19th century. Um, but by the time the the work I'm playing is a, is a, a late work. It's part of um, his uh, um, opus, uh, the Iberia Suite. And it, that's considered it, um, by many, myself included, to be his greatest um, achievement. And um, by then, he had been very um, deeply influenced by uh, the, the um, Impressionist movement. Um, but uh, these pieces, um, it's a major opus, not really an opus, but it consists of four books, uh, three pieces each, so that's 12 pieces, and um, they're all very major, they're all very large scale works that get all over the keyboard, and um, uh, at an hour and a half, uh, really make a perfect recital length. And um, he lived during a time uh, where there was kind of an explosion of um, piano music coming out of um, Spain uh, with Defaya and um, uh, I'll just read it off here in a second. Um, and I had a teacher, um, Walter Hauksig, who um, bemoaned that you know piano students play never play any Spanish music, and you know thinking back. You know, uh, there's a lot of French music, there's a lot of Chopin, there's a lot of German music that's played, there's a lot of Russian music that's played, but, you know, at least when I was coming through, there was much less emphasis on Spanish music and Spanish, Spanish piano music. Um, and uh, there's, there's just a, a wealth of music there. Um, so this is Triana, and, and the, the Iberia Suite is, oh, you can't hear me. I'm talking to that microphone and I'm, I forgot. I have too much to do here. At any rate, the Iberia Suite um, is, is really uh, um, based on his impressions of his native country, Spain. And, and there's um, many of them that are inspired by locations. And this is, this Triana is one of those. And Triana is the gypsy quarter of Seville or Seville. Um, and, you know, he, I think is, you know, trying to capture some of the liveliness of, of, of that. Um, and, you know, some of the others are out of completely different moods and uh, some of them are very serious. But this um, Sevilla by Albania.
Next up is Chopin, of course. Uh, you've probably seen pianists read Chopin off his recital. You always wonder what happened to Chopin. Chopin was probably um, the best known uh, piano composer um, and much loved. Chopin was born in 1810, and, uh, and right around, within two years, Chopin was born, Liszt was born, I think in 1909, 1809. Um, Mendelssohn, uh, also 1810, and Schumann, Leonard Schumann, 1810. And these are all, you know, when you go to an old, old fashioned auditorium, a music hall, you know, th these, are the, these are the busts that will be carved into the sides of the wall. You know. um, and, and he knew these people, he knew these people uh, quite well. Uh, he knew Mendelssohn and Liszt extremely well because they lived in Paris where he lived. Uh, and he knew Schumann quite well, but you know, Schumann lived elsewhere and you know, they, would, they didn't know one another and they were big proponents of one another. I'm always amused, um, you know, I read somewhere that someone asked um, Chopin, who his favorite composer was, well, you have to remember who, who his buddies are. He's a, you know, some, some of the greatest composers that ever lived. And his favorites were uh, Mozart and Bach. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, you know, he's sitting around with these guys, but they're not his favorites. I wonder, I don't think they knew that, but I think they probably didn't care. But um, this work is, I believe, his longest um, solo piano work. It's a sonata in four movements. Um, he only wrote, well, he wrote four sonatas, one cello and piano sonata, and two piano sonatas. The only ones that are really played are the number two in the B flat minor, commonly known as the Funeral March Sonata. We get the slow movement as the Funeral March. Oh, ah, ah! I did all that talking and you couldn't hear it. I'm talking about the um, uh, the B minor Sonata, which is his longest uh, solo piano work. Um, I believe it is. Uh, he was famous for his miniatures, and he wrote. Uh, you know, waltzes and nocturnes and preludes and mazurkas and polonaises and, and several other forms and, um, and a few sonatas. And you have to bear in mind that, you know, if his, if his ideal is Mozart, well, he needs to pump out some sonatas. Uh, but he only pumped out the four. And I think that he wasn't quite as comfortable um, with that setting, but he, made, he, he certainly made a, a, a very... Um, uh, I mean, this sonata, this sonata in the B flat minor sonata, is very, very successful. I can't speak to the cello sonata because I never played it. Um, in the C minor sonata, is uh, number one was is considered a student work. I don't know it very well, but um, this work in four movements, uh, you know, you get a heart pounding um, uh, finale that always brings the house down. That's why people like to play this, and sometimes in competition, if you just hear play the last movement because it still brings the house down even though you didn't play all the rest of it. What's, uh, what I find interesting is, is trying to give um, the musical line life. And um, I've played this work on and off for many years and I hesitate to say how many uh, because that might give away my age, which is considerable. Um, but um, in the first movement, it, you know, it, it, 
it's very melodic. And the first movement, you know, is a sonata allegro form. Um, Mozart could have written it. Well, Mozart couldn't. Mozart didn't write in that style. But you know, if you do a, a um, uh, theoretical analysis, you'll see that things are very square and very, you know, very much, you know, uh, follow the rules of, uh, you know, phrase length, eight, eight bar phrase lengths, and, um, you know, the, the relationships, you know, are classically um, uh, appropriate, but in a, in a um, romantic style. Um, I, in, in, the, in a way, that's the most challenging movement is to, is to, um, find the, the life, the line, and the melodic lines in, the, in that first movement. And also, um, the third movement, I, in, in some ways, is the most challenging because um, that's the slow movement and, uh, um, you know, is there a giveaway in the B-flat minor or the funeral march? You know, you can easily be inspired or, you know, you can find inspiration there. But in the, in the the third movement, uh, there's no other, there's nothing else Chopin wrote that is really like the third movement. Um, it's in a simple ABA, well, it's not that, I guess it is, an ABA section. The outer. Option in the stream, and um, that's concerning because during my testing of this, if you stop the stream and then restart the stream, the stream goes to another web address. And I wanted to make sure that didn't happen. At any rate, um, the uh, third movement um, is, a, is, is really a lifelong challenge to try to capture uh, the, the musical line. And uh, I was saying that the outer the outer parts are in are in four four, so it's it's more metered. But the middle section is is like it's like a it's in two, it's in two two two, um, and it's it's like I think of it as a beautific, um, you know, awakening or something. It, you know, there's just something very peaceful and very calm about it. Um, and I don't know if my interpretation of the line along that line works or not. But if it doesn't work, then you have the last movement which uh, always works. So, show me the B minor sonata. And let me switch the microphone back. I think I'm still... Okay, here we go.
I hope I'm still broadcasting. It's green. That doesn't mean that you're getting it at the website I sent you to, but I guess I'll just keep going. That, um, that piece, uh, I often wish that it ended a little differently. And those of you that are pianists or know it uh, uh, can probably relate to the ending of the B flat minor scherzo, second scherzo. Um, and I always thought it would be nice if he had ended it in a similar way, like this. lyric pieces. He kept coming back to the lyric pieces. I believe there's four sets of them. Um, and I'm reminded, uh, uh, or I'm remembering a story that uh, Rubinstein tells in his um, autobiography, My Young Years, when uh, he learns the Grieg um, piano concerto um, and against the advice of, uh, of many others. And the, the argument against learning the Greek concerto is that Grieg was not, and he, he writes about this in his, in his book, Grieg was not considered a serious composer at that time. And he just, he just said, well, the heck with that, that's a wonderful piece. And it is a wonderful piece. And, and he really got quite a lot of mileage out of that, um, out of that piece. But, uh, you know, his music doesn't have the compositional complexity of a Brahms or a Wagner or, um, uh, you know the, the Viennese school or anything like that, but what it but what his uh, you know he certainly has become well recognized and accepted as a serious composer. Yes, he was a serious composer, and these lyric pieces really demonstrate uh, the lyric his lyricism, and he was able to take in a very simple way an idea and express that in music, and that is extremely difficult to do. It's like um, you know, when you're a child, you know, so many things are easy. You know, you can draw and, and do all this stuff. And then as you become an adult, you learn, you forget how to do that. You forget how to make something simple. One of the most scary markings uh, in, in music is semplice or simply, play simply. That's very difficult to do because we have all forgotten how to do it. But, um, you know, Grieg, um, I, I think he certainly had success in his lifetime, and, um, and Rubinstein was correct. And the reason I like this piece, you know, there's, um, there's a, a Wagner, uh, and a, a, there's a Wagner wedding march, and a, um, I think it's also a wedding march by Mendelssohn. Uh, but these are, are really uh, recessionals, or, or um, you know, uh, whatever the op opposite is of a recessional, uh, concessional. <laughs> But the music that would be appropriate for the service, and so they think of a wedding as a service. Whereas what I like about this piece is that the, it's the wedding day, and the wedding is the, is the whole day long. And I learned it for a specific purpose. Um, my son is getting married. And I had hoped to play it at his wedding, but then he didn't have a wedding uh, yet <laughs> because of the virus. So I'll, I'll play it here. So this is Wedding Day at Roja. Thank you. 
So um, that's it. I hope this uh, actually broadcast. I won't know until much later. Uh, and I don't even know how to stop this. How? Let's see. Why do you stop? Is this is this the